Welcome everyone to Zoom in the Books this afternoon. We have award-winning author Richard Battle with us discussing his new book, The Unopened Present, with guest interviewer Burke Allen from Allen Media Strategies. Burke, take it away. Hey, thank you so much for being here today on a very special simulcast of Zoom into Books with our friends from Headline Books and also the Big Time Talker podcast, and we broadcast live uh, all over the World Wide Web. You can get us at iHeartMedia, Spotify, iTunes, wherever you download your podcast. New episodes drop every Tuesday, and we love to talk about books, and it's all made possible by our friends at SpeakerMatch.com, the world's largest online virtual speakers bureau. If you're a platform speaker or maybe you're a meeting planner and you need a speaker, you can find one another at the online marketplace there at SpeakerMatch.com. Our guest today is a speaker. He's also a media personality, a business advisor, and a very prolific author who, as of this recording of the program, has just been named by the New York Book Festival as an award winner. He got a runner-up mm -hmm. award at the New York Book Festival uh, last night for Best Spiritual Book. The book is The Unopened Present. The author is Richard Battle, and we want to welcome him to the show. First of all, congratulations. Well, uh, thank you for having me, and that's great news. I'm very honored and humbled. This book, um, The Unopened Present, took a lot of years uh, to write, and it was bookended by a couple of very uh, big life events for you. You've done something that's pretty amazing, Richard, with this book, and I have the book right in front of me. You have um, you've taken something that is really tough, about as tough a stuff as, as you can handle in this life, and you managed to turn it into something positive. So um, I want to ask you to start this, this conversation if you believe in coincidences. Absolutely not. Uh, but it's very interesting how two totally independent events over a 25-year period came together that brought this book out. And that's, that's what's so amazing. And I just I think about that, and it just shows me the hand of providence involved in the details in our lives, much more so than we think. The book is called The Unopened Present. And uh, by the way, Headline Books uh, is, the, is the publisher, and they present Zoom into Books, which is a great opportunity for you to find out uh, what you want to read uh, during these dog days of summer. And maybe what you want to take to the beach or better yet curl up in front of your air conditioner and, and read. And this is a book that will hit home, I think, for a lot of parents and grandparents, Richard, about the life lessons we all want to teach our kids. And, and, and you know, what, what happens if you don't live to communicate those life lessons? And you thought about that when you became a father for the first time uh, at the ripe old age of 45. And you, you wrote this letter with a lot of uh, scriptural truths, things you wanted to pass down to him, but it it didn't work out where uh, it, it was going to happen the way that you wanted it to happen. Well, yes, and what's happened is so amazing to me because you're right. At, at that particular age, I was thinking one day, what happens if I don't live to teach my son the important lessons in life? And most young parents are thinking about making next week's paycheck, making right. next month's rent, paying food bills every week, what the kids are doing, things of that nature. And, and it's very seldom that you think when you're younger about these important life lessons that are so crucial. And here I thought about it because if I wasn't there, what did I want my son to learn? And let so me ask I you, let me stop you there for a second. You were 45 when you had uh, your son, John, yes. was that intentional? Did you wait intentionally until a little bit later in life to be a dad? Well, it worked out that way. <laughs> so <laughs> it worked out that was the first opportunity just based on how life unfolded. And I was very appreciative to have him. He was the first uh, child in my family with our surname in 28 years. And so he was very special, not only to me and my wife at the time, but our entire family. And uh, so I gave great thought into him and what he could become and wanted to make sure whether I was there or not, 
that he would have those foundational lessons uh, to learn. Were you nervous about being a dad at 45 years old? Do you remember those times of people giving you advice and, and, and all that would take me back in time to, well, that, that I don't time think, I don't think I was, I was nervous. Uh, I was very grateful to finally, after all of those years to have that opportunity. And that's why I think I gave it more thought and then thinking about, Oh gosh, what happens if I don't live long enough to teach him these lessons until he's a grown man? What lessons do I want him to know that he can te teach his children, my grandchildren, and generations beyond that are important, that make a difference, not only in his life, but others' lives? So I'm, I'm assuming during this whole process, you're like the oldest guy in the Lamaze classes. You're the <laughs> oldest guy in the parenting classes. Was there a time in, that you thought, this is just not going to happen for me? I'm not going to be a dad. Well, yes, and, and later with my daughter, uh, I was always about a generation older than most of the other parents on the, her softball teams and all the different things like that. I was an older parent than, than most uh, in the group. So you sit down at 45 years old, you've got a newborn son, John, and you, you write him a letter, a Dear John letter, I guess. And, yes. and in it, you, you have these truths, these things you want to lay out uh, for him, and you base them biblically. You're uh, you're a man of faith, but really there are a lot of sort of common sense life lessons too about how to how to survive and get along and do well on this earth. Yeah, primarily common sense, but it's it's interesting, and we ended up with scriptural examples once we wrote the book and expanded uh, later. But I outlined forty three lessons. A friend of mine asked me recently about it, why 43? And I said, well, that's all I thought of at the time. <laughs> because basically I thought and I deeply thought about what do I want him to learn? And each one of them had a point, but I did not elaborate on each one of them as I've done in the book. And that's a whole story in and of itself that's happened 25 years later. So this story takes a really tough turn. Um and I'll let you share with, with our listeners and viewers what happened to, to upend this, this whole story. Well, everything was going well. My son had never had a fever, never been a sick a day. Uh, we were in, really enjoying him as he grew. I wrote the letter when he was six months old. And three months later, all of a sudden, he passed in his crib one night. Uh, and like a snap in the fingers. Totally unexpected. Total shock total disruption, uh, unbelievable grief. Uh, and eventually I ended up writing a book, Surviving Grief by God's Grace, which told the experience of surviving that. And I put this letter in there as an appendix. And then after that, the letter pretty well sat dormant for many years. I, you know, I, I tread gently on asking you this, but what do you remember about those days and how you got through those days? Because that's that's got to be about the worst thing you can imagine. Well, yes. And what, the first lesson I'd learned, and, and there were 12 lessons I wrote about surviving grief by God's grace, I learned at the funeral service. And my pastor, who's now my 87-year-old mentor, the first point he made was the impact of a life's more important than its length. And my son only lived nine months. But through this book, through the grief book, other efforts that I've done, his life continues to impact other people because of the thoughts and love that were given to him and the letter that was written. And now this book, it continually adds to his impact. And he taught me more than I had time to teach him was another of the lessons in there because in nine months, I couldn't teach him very much. But I learned so much after that loss that's helped me in the going years. And one of the things that happens when we suffer a loss, the general question always is, why me? Right. And what I learned was that, at least for me, is not the right question. Because why me looks in the past. Uh, there's no one there. And so many people get trapped in that past looking for why me? What did I do to deserve this? And all of us in life experience ups and downs and tragedies. None of us are exempt. And so why me 
acts like we're exempt, so why should we experience tragedy? And I had a guy in the guard unit I was with that uh, after I had my loss, he told me he lost three children in one night in a house fire. So one of the lessons I learned was things can always be worse. Sure. And so I learned the right question for me is what now? What am I supposed to learn from this event that I can use to help others? And that question looks in the future and the creator who I have faith in is in the future waiting for me to catch up to him. And so when I think about that, I think about ways I can share lessons I've learned to help others. And I believe that smart people learn from their experience. Brilliant people learn from the experience of others. And I'm trying to share experiences to help others in their walk. It's ultimately a very uplifting book. It's The Unopened Present. Yes. And it's uh, been just named a runner-up at the New York City Book Festival for Best Spiritual Book. So congratulations uh, to Richard on that win. You can find out more about The Unopened Present and all his other books at richardbattle.com. book is also available at headlinebooks.com, wherever books are sold. Um, I opened the conversation asking if you believe in coincidences because there was something of a coincidence that actually... Uh, if you believe in that sort of thing, led to <laughs> the publication of this book over two decades later. So I, I think it's a pretty interesting story. So share well, that with our, our viewers and listeners. Well, this was such a humbling story because in 2022, uh, you and your team helped put out some uh, publicity around Father's Day and earned me some radio interviews, one of which was in Iowa at WMT, and I'd been on there several times with Doug Wagner. All of the hits on that station were generally four to five minutes long. Right. And that particular day, the week before Father's Day, we scheduled 739 in the morning. And I was dropping my truck off for service at the dealership, ended up at the sales lounge to do the interview, which was four minutes long. Uh, phone call. We're in the middle of the interview. I hear a noise. Somebody walked by. I don't pay any attention to them. We finish the interview and I start my hour long drive back home. Halfway back, the phone rings. I don't recognize the number, so I don't answer. Uh, at the next red light, I see a voicemail from the dealership. And of course my response is, oh gosh, they messed Here up we something, go. I'm gonna have to go back. Here That's we go, this response. is gonna cost hundreds of dollars more. Yes. And so I called the number back and the man on the phone said, were you the person talking in the sales lounge a few minutes ago? And I said, yes. And he goes, well, I just wanted to call and say, thank you. I prayed to God last night. I was in such pain and suffering. And I prayed to God last night that he would send somebody to say something that could help me. And you were that person, in my opinion, what you said helped me. He didn't know that I was on the radio. Uh, the people in Iowa didn't know that someone in Texas listening to my end of the phone conversation was benefiting from that interview. But yet here he was brought together by your actions, the radio station in Iowa, and him walking through there just during that four minute period and catching my end of the conversation helped him in his grief because he said he'd lost his daughter a couple of months ago. And I was stunned and humbled. Sure. And so the next week I was talking to one of my great friends and I shared that story with him. He knew about my son and about the grief book and about the letter. And he says, you need to write a book about that letter and about this story because they are tied together and you can be a great help to people. And so that's what I did was go back to each of those 43 lessons, expanded on each one. Uh, with context, examples, quotes, and one scriptural quote that would illustrate those particular points. And each one of them, I believe, are potential life-changing lessons for the reader. The book we're talking about is The Unopened Present. It was named runner-up at the New York Book Festival last night for Best Spiritual Book. And Ann Graham Lotz, Billy Graham's daughter, says The Unopened Present is a rich treasure chest of practical biblical wisdom. It's brief, easy to read lessons are relevant to all who seek to live life well. That's uh, that's pretty high praise indeed. 
so this this uh, telephone interview, four minute telephone interview, while you're sitting in a car dealership lounge in Austin, Texas, uh, with a station in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, touches someone's life, causes you to go back and write this book. I wonder, was it tough for you to go back in time and put yourself in the place of, of that grief stricken father, 45 years old, who just lost his son and to reread these things again? Well, it a little bit, but it's it's been some time. And again, when I look at it, I look at it as a, a positive. I mean, it's bittersweet from the lost, but right. it's sweet from the standpoint of having an opportunity to take that letter and expand on it and share it with other people and help them where they're at. And that's one of the greatest thrills and encouragements for someone like myself is knowing that you've touched someone and helped them where they're at, because we never know where that will lead to from that person's change of their experience and that lesson that they've learned, the experience, the example, we never know how that will affect people throughout time. And so to be a part of that for someone is a great thrill. You know, I've got a son who's going away to college this year. There are thousands of parents that are in the same place uh, where they're sending their kids away to school and, and you know, sort of kicking the baby bird out of the nest. As I look through this book and at these life lessons that you want to teach your kids, it's great for kids who are going away to college, and this is a perfect time for that. I wonder, as you started to compile all this again, Richard, was there sort of a, a target age for kids? Is this a in your mind, something for kids as they go into high school, as they go away to college, as the adult child gets married, who do you think would benefit from this the most? <laughs> well, that's a great question. And I've had feedback from people who are giving it as high school graduation gifts, college graduation gifts, even baby showers. I've had people tell me they're giving this as a gift for baby showers for new parents. Uh, I hope that kids 12 and up would read it because I think they can understand it and implement it if they're looking to improve themselves. And that's the key is if the kids are looking to improve themselves, this can help them. If they're not, then it's up to the parents to be able to digest the lessons and be able to share it with kids in a way that can be helpful to them. And again, I hope that parents will look at this, share the ideas, but also it may inspire them to come up with their own list or family history or different things to give their children a broader perspective of their family and life as well. This would be a great gift to give to high school graduates. You know, if you're an aunt or an uncle or grandparents or a friend and, you know, you don't know exactly what to get them. This is the kind of book that sort of cuts across all that. And although this book won Best Spiritual Book Runner Up at the New York Book Festival, as, as my pastor friend Sean would say, this is not the kind of book where you slap them upside the head with a King James Bible, right? No, absolutely not. And uh, there's one scriptural example for each lesson, but the primary text gives real life experiences, quotes, and ideas that can help somebody with each one of these lessons. And that, that to me, the real life experience that someone can learn from my experiences or the historical people that I share in here, that's the opportunity. And I've even had grandparents give it to their children to teach the grandchildren. <laughs> so you're right about grandparents on that. And the key is people who are looking for ideas to improve themselves. And the late Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said, a man's mind once expanded by a new idea cannot return to its previous state. And we never know when or how or where we're going to pick up an idea that can be life-changing. And if we're looking for them in books like The Unopened Present, we're more likely to find them than if we're just walking down the road not really thinking about life-changing events. Richard Battle is the author of a lot of books. The brand new one is The Unopened Present. It's an award winner at the New York Book Festival, named it a runner-up for Best Spiritual Book at uh, their awards just last night in the Big Apple. So I want to, and I've got the book with me right here, 
go to a couple of the examples of these these 43 very random number it's your 43 <laughs> spiritual truths and and you do a, a page or two after each one of them and you, you kind of lay out uh the lesson and there's a a scriptural quote that supports it some of these things i think may be easier said than done so i want to ask you about them for example in today's world lesson number five richard battle says always have a positive attitude that's tough well i believe it is tough and life and is not so much about what happens to us but how we respond to it and people that have negative attitudes generally never accomplish anything positive and other people don't want to be around them i believe to achieve anything you have to have a positive attitude you can't achieve anything with a negative attitude people want to be around winners they want to support winners uh, they want to be on teams with them and so it's so important to have that positive attitude and outlook on life i had a guy i worked with years ago uh, every time I'd call him, I'd say, hey, Bob, how you doing? And his answer always was not worth a DAXM. <laughs> and so it was a very depressing thing talking to him. I would try to lift his spirit, but he never achieved anything positive because he was always negative. The people I know who've been the most successful aren't the people that didn't suffer loss. They're the people that went through loss with a positive attitude, knowing that they could face it and overcome it and still be successful and that to me is the key lesson number 14 in the unopened present you will make mistakes don't be afraid so i'm going to put you on the spot give me a big mistake you made and how you overcame it oh gosh i made a mistake in selecting a, a company to work for one time <laughs> and on the other end uh, from a mistake of an investment, I learned and avoided going to a company in San Francisco <laughs> because of the lesson I learned. And so we will make mistakes in life. And a lot of times people are afraid to make mistakes because they get criticized when they make one. And the best companies, the best parents, the best individuals recognize that we're all going to make mistakes. And the question is, what can we learn from that mistake to help us grow and succeed the next time. And if we live in that mistake, we'll never grow. If we take that mistake and learn from it and go risk again, we will have a greater success in the future. Number 34 in the book. I like this one because this applies an awful lot to today's social media landscape, which is pretty toxic. That lesson is feelings of anger and envy don't hurt the other person half as much as they hurt you because they prevent you from focusing and achieving positive results. Well, now, you've got a pretty a interesting great... example in here of, of what happened to you uh, right there in your hometown of Austin, Texas, that ties right into that. Well, yes, and I believe forgiveness is the greatest gift we can give ourselves. It's a gift for us. And it's hard to believe with the real estate market in Austin, Texas in 2023, that there was a depression in real estate in the late 80s and I had invested straight commission sales guys scrimping my nickels together to try to provide financial security. And lo and behold, the market went south and it was dragging me down with it. And I had people that stiffed me when I sold properties. They stiffed me on rent. And it, it would have been very easy for me to have held a grudge against them and allowed that negativity to drag me down with it. And what I realized is those people didn't care about me. They had their own problems. And whether I was mad at them or held a grudge against them or whatever else, they didn't care. And so the only person that was hurt by that negative feeling was me. And right. it prevented me from responding and being able to be more successful. And so once I decided to forgive them and move on, and look at things positively, I was able to move on and resume a successful career. And that to me was a great example of how holding a grudge and not forgiving people hurts us more than the people that we have a problem with. These are all lessons that uh, the Richard wrote down uh, for his, his little boy, John, in case John outlived him, which should have happened. It didn't happen. 
but he brought them all back together 25 years later in this brand new award-winning book called The Unopened Present. Here's one that is also sort of in the news now. It's lesson number 39. Revere the past. The wisdom of the ages is at your fingertips. There's a lot of talk now about uh, our political leaders and ageism. You know, Mitch McConnell freezes up for 30 seconds doing a press conference. The president of the United States is a gaffe machine. You know, the former president is 76 years old. You know, everybody is up in years there. Lots of questions about whether uh, there should be an age limit placed on our political leaders. You don't delve into politics in this book at all, but you do say to revere the past and the wisdom of the ages. What do you mean by that? Well, and I'm not talking about politicians' ages. I'm talking about in our phones. We can go look at the Greek philosophers from 2,400 years ago. We can look at the Romans. We could look at the Europeans or the Chinese, other civilizations. We can learn from that history of people who lived before us. And I'm a believer that human nature is the same today as it was from the beginning. And Thucydides a Greek philosopher 2,400 years ago said the only thing that remains constant is human nature. It's always there. And yet we have people today who believe human nature evolves. And when they do that, and if that were true, that means the Bible. It means the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. It means history 50 or 100 years ago doesn't mean anything because we're different people. But I argue against that. I think we can look back in history and see that people thousands of years ago were just like us and we're just like them. And that means people 50 and 100 and 500 years from now will be the same nature that we are. And if that's true, that means everything that's happened in the past is available for us to learn from. And Churchill said those who fail to learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. And that was an illustration of learning from past history. When you went back and dusted off this document that you written for, for John John 25 years ago, um, were there any that, that were not applicable or were they all still evergreen and did they all make the book? Oh, they all made the book. They're all evergreen. I think that 50, 100 years from now, they'll all be as applicable as they are today. And that that's one of the things that's fascinating. You mentioned about revere the past, the wisdom of the of the ages at your fingertips, I never dreamed when I wrote this that anyone would question that because it had been a no-brainer throughout history. Yeah, but they do. You know, folks now question the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence and wonder about, uh, you know, whether those documents are still as important and relevant in 2023 as they once were. And, and your thought is, yes, absolutely. Well, and it's even worse than that because now to give people license to do what they want to do, they advocate for people defining their own truth. And to me, truth is, is. <laughs> and truth is not a subjective thing. Truth is an objective thing. And if you believe in objective truth, then I can't say that I'm a 45-year-old a woman of whatever creed or race or whatever, I can't identify as that because that's not true because the objective truth is I am what I am. Right. And so that's how silly it's become. And if we allow people to define their own truth and not look at the history, then we basically are flying by the seat of our pants and everybody's doing what they want to every day. And we cannot have a civilization that's run like that. The book, The Unopened Present, is published by Headline Books. It's available now in bookstores everywhere. And Anne Graham Lotz uh, praised the book. She says, thank you, Richard Battle, for sharing blessings that have come from your brokenness. Ultimately, even though uh, it was tragic that you lost your little boy um, when he was just nine months old, you were able to do something positive with that grief. So many times you, you see examples, Richard, where People aren't able to move past a tragic event in their life. They sort of become stuck there, and that becomes their whole purpose. That becomes their whole life. And, and I get it. I can't imagine how hard that must have been for you. But you were able to, to go on, and you took uh, what is arguably the toughest thing that can happen to a man and, and 
and have a, a successful life afterwards. If someone is is listening to the podcast now or watching Zoom into books and they're in a, a tough situation of their own, is there a piece of advice, one piece of advice you would give them on how to overcome the tough stuff? Well, my faith was was helpful. I was devastated with a loss, even though I had a deep faith. And a couple who had lost a son a few years earlier, they helped give me hope in life's future at the time. And that's what changed because I didn't care if I lived or died. And I recognized and I believe in my faith that I will see my son again in eternity. And that's helpful because now every day I believe in life, we're here for a purpose. We're here to do something. And the question is, what are we going to do with the time we're given? Are we going to waste it or are we going to use it in a way that helps other people? And I believe looking back, on our forebears in America and beyond, people built civilizations and gifted that to us. And it's our responsibility and obligation to add to that, preserve it, and pass it along to future generations and give them a gift that's better than the one we received. And that's what we should be doing. And failure to do that is a sad situation if we just focus on our self-pleasure and entertainment and things of that nature versus trying to use our time to help others. There's an old saying, you know, time heals all wounds. Did, did time make a difference? What, what made the big difference for you and being able to, to move on and, and, and turn that grief into this positivity? Well, time, time helped. Uh, getting hope initially was the first thing. And then as I studied, the way I dealt with the grief was I studied scripture. I read every book I could get my hands on about loss of a child. And then I journaled. And about five months after uh, I lost my son, another couple in our church lost a son. And I shared my notes and what I had learned through that experience with them. And they said, you should write a book about that. And that turned into Surviving Grief by God's Grace, which even today, 20 years after it was published, I'll have people come up to me or communicate with me that how it's benefiting to them. And that just makes me feel so good because the worst thing that could happen would be to lose my son and nothing positive to come out of that experience. In the unopened present, there are 43 of these life lessons, spiritual truths, and you break them down um, in each lesson. Which one? Which one is the one? Is there one that you point to that maybe trumps the others? Oh, well, the first one that I think is most important in anyone's life is God exists, have faith, pray, and listen. And I think everyone should have a faith. And I'm not going to sit here and tell them what, what they should do. But if you don't have a faith in anything besides this world, it's a pretty sad state to live in. And so having a faith in something beyond our current life here, something that's better helps us have a purpose in serving others and making the most of this life we're given. You think that that last part, the listening is tougher now because there's so <laughs> much buzzing around us. I mean, everybody's got their phone in their hand all the time and the TV has 57 channels and nothing on and bam, bam, bam. Do you think it's tougher to listen now? Well, I'll give you my experience. And I was uh, fully immersed in the corporate world when I wrote these lessons. And I can say that I was so goal focused that I probably didn't listen very well at that time because I had objectives in mind and I set my nose to the grindstone and pursued them. And I'll bet I missed a lot of communication that I should have been listening for. And one of the advantages of the situation I'm in now, it's unbelievable how often I'll hear something, something that I need to write to put into a book, something I need to make a note of and put into a speech, something I need to say in a, in a program like this. And it is humbling every time how often that happens when you're in tune and listen and hear it. And it makes me want to be in tune more often and not be out of tune because I don't want to miss that communication anymore. It's an award-winning book. 
uh, runner-up at the New York Book Festival for Best Spiritual Book, The Unopened Present, from Richard Battle online at richardbattle.com. Also, headlinebooks.com, wherever you get great books, you can pick this up. It is a very positive book. And when you finish, you may not believe in coincidences either. Richard, thanks for spending time with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. The Unopened Present from our host at Headline Books. And that does it for another online edition of Zoom Into Books. Thank you so much for watching and thank you for listening to our Big Time Talker podcast. We drop new episodes every Tuesday all over the web. For our special guest, award-winning author Richard Battle, author of The Unopened Present, and for Belinda and Kathy and the whole gang at Headline Books, I'm Burke Allen at our studios in Washington, D.C. Thank you for being here. Now go out and make it a great day. Bye, everybody.